All right, we're back here talking with George Dickerson and Josh Becker. And uh, before we left, uh, I know uh, uh, George wanted to get into talking about the real R-E-A-L. But before we do that, I have had one question because, uh, George, uh, earlier uh, this week uh, when we were talking, you had mentioned uh, you thought Tom Hanks was a, a really good actor. And I've never been a, a Hanks fan, but... I wanted I want you to explain what you you were saying how technically he's a good actor and for a lay folk like me we only see the person on the screen and we maybe like their persona or the character or, or whatnot. Yeah, but we don't see the craft in right. action. Right. And like, I I always thought Hanks was a good light or comic actor, but I've never really bought him in dramatic roles. What makes in your opinion Hanks a good actor technically? Well, for one thing, it's harder to be a comic actor than it is a dramatic actor. It's much harder, uh, and particularly on screen, because you don't have the audience there to react off or time yourself off of. And so when they say, well, he's a good comic actor, comic actor, but he's not a good actor, it's actually tougher. I find comedy much tougher to do, and most actors do. Okay. Uh, to answer your question about from that aspect. Um, Tom is, you know, if you go to the film Big, for example, did you that's see that film where he, where he plays the little boy that suddenly is yeah. growing into an adult? Um, I mean, he was just, I mean, he captured so much the essence of a an adult who's still a boy, who's mm-hmm. just a little child. I mean, it was impeccable. Forrest Gump is another example where I, I could see him just sitting on the bench from the back and they're doing a rear shot of him and just the attitude of his body was totally in the persona not of tom hanks but as forrest gump it was absolutely truthful to the character just the way he was sitting there uh this is a this is a master craftsman of of acting tom tom hanks is and you can see it in every tiny little gesture Uh, now you you said he's true to the character does that tie into your idea of the real oh uh well uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, re- re- you know, being real or, or it was real is a big word in Hollywood, and that's a word I've always detested. I <laughs> came out of uh, watching uh, Sophie's Choice with Meryl Streep but in a blow. I was blown away by, by her performance, and there was these two young would-be starlets outside uh, who had never done anything, and she, they said, oh, and Meryl was good, but I just wish she'd be more real. <laughs> And it's a word they use in Hollywood because they don't understand what actors do is act. Yeah. Uh, they think they just come in. And, and real is, is treacherous for the actor because it means, okay, I'm playing a cop. Okay, well, you've got to be the cop, you know, just, just kind of the real cop. Well, I've played lots of cops, a different one in Blue Velvet and a different one in Hill Street Blues and a different one in Death Wish 4. But I'm not playing the cop in any of them. I'm playing an individual character, and they all are totally different personae. So, and and what the word real does, it's, uh, it, it talks about kind of our general impression of what uh, uh, reality is. So, as opposed to, let me just finish this yeah, thought. Yeah, I'm, I'm just um, a, yeah. As opposed to letting me surprise you and making you believe a truth about this individual character. Uh, the word real limits the actor's imagination to come up with, say, okay, let, let, let me stretch this character to find a truth about life in some way or other that you'll believe surprisingly. Okay. So, in, in some ways, what you're talking about when they say real, they're talking about stereotypes and cliches mm-hmm. and lowest common denominators. Absolutely. Or just being yourself, just being your own self there. Okay. Uh, instead of being the character. Right. Okay. So, he, this is a slight left turn, but it, but I think it ties in. One of the worst things, in my opinion, that's happened to TV in the last ten years, and now it's starting to happen in movies, is this so-called reality television programming. Yes, absolutely. That's um, I think it's awful. I think it's first place. It's not reality. Exactly. It's deceitful. It's hypocritical mm-hmm. because, in fact, it's been edited for drama to maximize conflict and story versus the fact you know watching people sit around for six hours a day. Well, there's a difference between that and like an American Idol, which is more like the old game show. Yeah, I'm talking about shows like Cops and the Real World yeah. and, and and that crap and Survivor even. Um, I'd like the two of you to opine about this trend a little bit. Well, uh, I'd like to do that, but I'd like to get Josh's reaction to my okay. little tirade there against the real. How do you feel about that as a director, Josh? Uh, yeah, real means nothing. 
it's you know I would never say to an actor act real. Okay. You know I I entirely agree with you, and I do think it would be limiting. Uh, I want what they're bringing to it. I don't want them to just be them. Right. You know I expect my actors to act. And I say it sometimes just to be amusing. Actors commence acting now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there was, I, I saw, uh, I was watch, when I watched Wall Street, um, they had the little featurette and they were talking about uh, uh, Oliver Stone's script. And I'm just wondering, too, um, how, how closely to uh, a script do most directors or do you, Josh, allow actors to, to veer, uh, do you allow for improvisation or do you, you know, stick to the script? That's the way I well, wrote people it. People don't understand improvisation. <laughs> that, that improvisation really comes in rehearsal. Okay. And you go, oh, that was good, do that again. Okay. So when you get to performance, you're not, it's not, you've done it enough times so that you're not really improvising at that moment. You but may well have that. come up with improvs for the scene, but you did it in advance, and, and they got to be okay. Yeah, you can't do that uh, for one reason. You're shooting sometimes shooting the same scene over and over again 25 times from different angles, and uh, you've got to match in the editing room. So right. you can't suddenly improvise sudden, something right here when they're but, shooting over your shoulder or something. Um, or you know, shoot a master shot, and then you're not. That isn't in the master shot, and you, you can't change. Well, with the but exception, I love improvisation in rehearsal. With, right. with the I exception the of Cassavetes, you know, with with films that are like Cassavetes <coughs> and. Um, but he rehearsed the heck out of his stuff. He was a really good director and a really good actor. I mean, they're not making it up on the moment. Right. Okay. They really know their scene. I re think I remember Dustin Hoffman saying that in an interview. He's like, everyone seems to think improvisation is right then and there, but no, we rehearse it first, you know? Yeah, you come up with these ideas and you go, oh, that was a great bit. I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm sitting there as the director watching them and, and going, ooh, 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 <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, but I, my, I, it's my job to remember the things I liked that they did. Right. To... Uh, to, to track back now to what you were asking Dan uh, about the Survivor shows uh, yeah. I didn't want to, want to lose that uh, now I think it's, that it's pretty much terrible but it, it represents uh, part, of, part of it is because we, we now have um, so much horror on uh, concentrated on um, over, uh, you know cable TV news so called news you know where, where they're just showing you uh, and and Tracy Peterson or somebody else, you know, um, all the time, twenty four hours a day, of reality. Right. So they've actually trained the audience, and it isn't reality, of course. It's 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 all different experts coming in to talk about this or that. So and so much of the old TV had become so formulaic. In other words, you've got the laugh track laid down uh, in the nineteen thirties. Uh, you're actually hearing dead people laugh from the 1930s right. on, on, on these uh, sitcoms. And uh, it had become so artificial, and so much of the writing for TV had, uh, in Hollywood had come from the joke writers, okay? So that uh, when they were asked, you can't just write jokes all the time, but that's what they do. A lot of these TV writers in Hollywood really are just ex-joke writers. Yeah. And, and, and so people... I'm not for the reality thing. I'm trying to explain it as a phenomenon. George. Well, I was involved with it at the beginning. Okay. Because Real Stories of the Highway Patrol was one of the earlier reality yeah, shows. Yeah, that predated Cops even, didn't it, I think? Uh, no, it didn't. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I misremembered. Uh, no, yeah. Cops was the season before. It was the ripoff. Oh, okay. Right. And uh, it was much lower budget, and the difference was it, Cops was on once a week, and Real Stories of the Highway Patrol was on five times a week. Oh, my. So in the course of, they ran for five years, they did over 500 episodes. But I did the reenactments. Of course, it's a lot cheaper to shoot those shows. Well, that's the key. That's, no, the, that's I'm glad the main you brought key. that up, because the key to these shows is they're way cheaper. It's way cheaper to get real people to do this stuff than hire actors. Sure. Yeah. My wife wants Jess to go oh, ahead. I just want to say that the dumbest reality show I've seen recently is called The Restaurant. It's about this guy who opens a restaurant in New York City, and it's saying... Will he make it, or will his business fold? Find out on the restaurant. And it's like, 
I don't care. I don't know this guy. <laughs> I'm not going to watch this. I can't believe they're so desperate. Let, let me just, uh, a point I, I've always uh, wondered, um, I really hate the laugh track uh, in television, but I have to say, and uh, especially Josh as a filmmaker, I really hate bad film scores. Um, <laughs> oh, as, and, as a composer, I agree totally. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the worst ones, uh, speaking of which, was In the Hours, the recent Oscar-nominated film, which I just thought was really, really oh, atrocious. Yeah, and I, I loved his stuff on, like, the, the Koyana Scotsi films right. uh, and, 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 and those types of films, but it was just terrible. And, and you don't need this sort of soaring crescendo uh, uh, the, when, when there comes the, the, the reuniting of the lovers and whatnot. I mean, some of the best films, what was the film just that we saw? Oh, uh, 13 Conversations About One Thing used a very minimal score. And I don't know if you, you know uh, that film. Uh, it really has a great performance by uh, Alan Arkin in it. But it, it, it uses just a subtle piano score. And I thought it was one of the most effective film scores. And yet, I, I think it, the whole thing must have just been a little bit of piano. And uh, Josh, uh, how, about film scoring, how important is that in your filmmaking? And, you know, do you... Uh, I've always worked with the same composer. uh uh-huh. And uh, strangely, I've known him for a very long time, and he's ended up doing the score for almost everything I've ever done because he did the score for Xena and Hercules. Oh, those are terrific scores. And all scores. four of my movies. Uh-huh. Some of the music that he did on Xena was extraordinarily beautiful. Uh, for TV, it was really amazing. It was, it was a amazing. orchestral score. With voices, and too, and all that. Yeah. All kinds of stuff. Yeah. yeah, he was constantly using, like, Bulgarian vocalists. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he's very, very talented. He lives just right near me here in Detroit, Joe Laduca. Right. And uh, he just wrote a piece I saw he wrote for the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. And I went and saw it. It was very good. Oh, excellent. Um, but I think it's crucially important, and I love that phase of filmmaking, because, and quite frankly, I'm glad you brought this up, I think it would aid movies tremendously if they brought the composer in at the beginning and let the filmmakers try to explain to the... Because when you talk to a composer, you work purely in psychology and emotion. Right. Mm. What's the psychology of the scene and what's the emotion of the scene? And that's what he's going to try to interpret into music. And if everybody understood that stuff before they made the movie... I think they'd all be better off. I've heard that this is exactly what uh, David Lynch does um, for most of his projects that Murray uses Angelo Badalamenti. Mm-hmm. Um, and speaking as somebody who knows most of Lynch's stuff, it, it worked particularly well on Twin Peaks and shows like Lost Highway, uh, movies like Lost Highway and Blue Velvet, where it's where, as you were saying, the music sort of underlines a scene, but it doesn't it doesn't overdo it. Mm. Yeah, well, it depends on how you, you know, a lot of composers, a lot of the old Hollywood scores. Right. Originally, you know, if you saw a ship, you know, they'd go to dun 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 yeah. dun, dun you know. Or corn the gold, theme. right. Yeah. And the idea over the course of time is to work more from the psychology of the character. Okay, yeah. So, and which I find fascinating. Well, let me let me ask this, well, um, just... Uh, I uh, just wanted to add yeah. to that, is that uh, I, you know... I think the best score this year of the nominated scores was the one from Frida, which won okay. the Oscar, and it, and it stood out. Uh, I was sent; I get sent all the scores and everything for the Oscar vote and um, and everything else. Um, so, um, and I couldn't bear to listen to the other scores more than once. Yeah, oh, sometimes really? not all the way through. But Frida's was an outstanding score. Okay. Well, let me just ask, um, and this might be out of. Uh out of the blue, um, I grew up in New York City. So, uh, uh, George, you may be familiar with back in the seventies and eighties on Channel Nine W O R the old Joe Franklin interview show. Oh yeah, I know Joe. Yeah. I, I met Joe once. I yeah, briefly. And and I I love that because as a kid, I grew up watching all the old silent films there, the right. the Keatons, the Lloyds, the Chaplins, the Fatty Arbuckles, and whatnot. And uh, in the late eighties, early nineties, when I started collecting some uh, silent films on DVD, I loved. I think it was called. Uh, Oh, I forget the name of the company, but I got a lot of the film scores from Chaplin, and they uh, they had you know real organ they had organ music uh, the scores for them. And I was wondering to what degree, because there wasn't any sound really uh, for for film when it first started in the silence. To what degree has uh, music scoring 
almost been a remnant uh, from that. I mean, because there you'd have the dramatic, you know, with the the organ soaring as uh, right. the the villain is twirling his mustache and whatnot. I'm just wondering, is that maybe a holdover? And how reliant have, did filmmakers become in those first quarter century or so without, you know, without sound on the film score? And has that been to a detriment of film? Well, let, let me get a little uh, intellectual here <laughs> and go back to the beginning of art, all art. Okay. The beginning of all art was a drum beat in the in the jungle. All right, somebody hitting a log on a uh, hitting on a log with a stick, and then there was a chanting. So, outside of visual, outside of painting. And there are some references in painting to music also, but there are some correspondences. But, you know, they've discovered um, bone flutes, 50,000-year-old mm-hmm. bone flutes right. in caves that have the same uh, tonal scale, except when we go atonal today, that we had back in primitive man. And those tonal notes uh, imitate uh, nature. And whether it's whale song or whether it's bird song or whatever, those, those harmonic gaps. And whales sing all the time across thousands of miles, and they actually sing in rhyme. Right. So music was central to, outside of painting, uh, but even so, but even when we write, and we've lost the art of music in, in writing today, uh, for the most part, as you often complain about in, in your website. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think the music actually contributes a lot to, to the film. Is that, do you agree with that, Josh? Absolutely. It, it's well, part of that visceral... Ramey, I mean, it's, it's, it's part, the glue that holds it all together. It's part of that visceral element, that subconscious visceral element. Right. That, that uh, you don't want to notice while it's going on, because, but you're reacting to it subconsciously. Billy Wilder, in his editing room, had a chant that as they watched their rough cuts of the movies, which get harder and harder to watch, mm-hmm. yeah. they would chant, Roja, Roja, Miklos Roja did his score. Right. Yeah. And until the score goes on, you don't know if the movie's working. Okay. It really okay. is the glue that holds it all together. It's interesting to me, um, since we're talking about composers, I... As a composer um, who has, you know, a bachelor's in composition and a degree in ethnomusicology, I grew up listening to experimental music, but also things like Korn, uh, Eric Wolfgang Korngold, Miklos Roja. I listened to their experimental... Oh, wait, I'm going to have to change phones. Hold okay. on. My phone is just about... Okay. Okay, I made it. Hello? Okay, great. Yeah. yeah, we're there. Okay, good. Okay, Dave, we'll just edit that bit out. So I was just... Or not. I was just listening to... Uh, um, you, you know, Miklos Roja and Korngold and some of these people that I didn't even know they were film composers because I knew their experimental concert works. I'm still actually a big fan of Korngold's Violin Concerto, which I know was a theme um, that he took from one of his movie scores. The thing that's interesting to me is most of the time, even though we don't really notice... Uh, you know, the music in a TV show or a movie, maybe I'm the exception in that I always notice and pay attention to it. Um, I think it makes or breaks whatever's going on visually and you if you have a section with no dialogue but the movie is uh, but the music is there it can be spine tingling mm-hmm. well high noon for example is famous for exactly that, that, that high noon was supposedly a failure until they actually added that song to it. okay uh do not forsake me oh my darling right right yeah and and that song made the film well, and more recent examples that come to mind, too. I mean, uh, I was just thinking of, of Night Shyamalan's uh, movie Unbreakable. It's not a great, it's not my favorite movie, but I've been listening to the soundtrack album over and over again lately. Um, is that, uh, who is that? Mark James Newton, Isham? Or? No, it's James Newton Howard. Oh, yeah. And I think he's done all of Knight's movies so far that I'm aware of anyway. Now, an interesting American composer is the one who appeared in Pull My Daisy, when you're speaking of that other director uh-huh. years ago David Amram right. who of course is a great jazz music- musician he's also a classical composer and he wrote the music for Splendor in the Grass right uh-huh. uh, and he, so he's, he's gone across the whole spectrum of American music 
Uh, David happens to be a friend of mine, but I mention with he's great a, awe because he's some such of a, the, uh, he can play he can play instruments from all around the world. Yeah. I'm, As a little anecdote in this, there's a show that it does it seems to be highly irregular on Bravo about film scoring. Okay. And they go by uh, genre, like it'll be action films. And recently there was an episode, and it started with The Great Escape, mm-hmm. and Elmer Bernstein discussing it, and it was absolutely fascinating. Okay. And he's a great composer, Elmer Bernstein. And then, to pr- try to be more modern, they went to Danny Elfman discussing the score for Mission Impossible 2. <laughs> okay. And what can this guy say? He's given a theme from the TV show right. that he brings in and out and in and out, and that's what he does. Right. And there was, it was so uninteresting. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the other, so. you know, uh, one of the interesting things about that movie, in fact, is that, <laughs> I don't know if anyone noticed, but the original Lalo Schifrin music is in 5-4. For the movies, they changed it to 4-4. Four, four. Well, they actually discussed that because they brought in two of the guys from U2 to do that. Right, yeah, the, the and rhythm section. the first section. thing they did is go, well, you know, you can't dance to it. Well, I think you can. <laughs> right, well, then they actually talked to Lalo <laughs> Schifrin for a second, and of course, the way it was originally done is fantastic. Oh, it's brilliant, yeah. Well, let's uh, end right there, and uh, when we come back on our final section uh, segment, uh, we'll talk a little bit more on uh, some stuff we haven't gotten to and just uh, shoot, uh, shoot the bull a little bit. So we'll listen to some more poems from George. The Lament of the Crash Test Dummy Technicians purse their indifferent lips while I am strapped in shoulder and groin, positioned, ready to accelerate the final impact of the concrete wall. Across the expanse of the car's front seat sits my randomly selected mate with her fake blonde hair and hard plastic skin, staring rigidly ahead as if we had aborted a hopeless argument, hardly the companion I might have chosen to accompany me to oblivion. Experiments, dummies, not meant to feel soon to be intimate and twisted steel. We could surely have spasmed sensual grace, a bit of tenderness, a touch of hands, a wisp of hair stroked from impassioned face, had we had but time and dexterity. Pardon me, but may I ask what it is I'm supposed to have done? What heinous crime have I perpetrated, roused from the dark, befuddled in my sleep, not half awake, hustled from a dream in sweet nakedness to be so callously flung across space like some senseless particle of matter. If only I were given soul to sing, I wouldn't tickle death in increments. Instead, I'd hope there's a god somewhere, and I'd make a banjo of cricket's wings, or imagine rooms full of meadowlarks and beasts whose great humps could eclipse the moon and salamanders that can dance in fire. Derelict Dreams Startled by the twig where the bony hand of winter claws the window, scratching now the scab of all his years, hoping to find the flesh still bleeds beneath the layered rags, grizzled chops, horny hands an empty bowl, roomy wine-bleared eyes plead against the night for a memory of a blossomed tree when he was small enough to climb beyond his knickered height and see Byzantium. Not enough the white steepled town that points a tolling finger, admonishing God for all its sins. Not enough the clenched fist of surly commerce or the accolades of friends, now long forgotten, now long dead. In rooms haunted by skeletons of trees, sleepless he ran to cheers of multitudes and heard a choir of starlings sing his name. He knew he wore a crown of golden thorns. How then this fall from grace, derelict dreams, in the crumbling doorway where now he curls are all he owns, craving epiphanies of drink, he begs a last orchestral swoon of stars and prays, conductor, raise your wand. 
Okay, uh, we're back here. Uh, in our last section, we're just going to uh, shoot the bull a little bit and uh, talk about uh, assorted things. And one of the things uh, uh, off, uh, off camera uh, I was uh, mentioning was how I really have uh, a boner against uh, biographical films. And generally, when I think of, uh, you know, George, you had mentioned Patton before. I think like Gandhi uh, are good, solid films. I don't know if you can make really a great biographical film. And one of the things, too, when uh, I've written poems about famous uh, individuals, I try to take a point of view and not necessarily do the whole thing. One of the things about biographical films that drives me crazy is you try to compress 40 or 50 years into 90 in, minutes. Into 90 minutes, and it's yeah. ridiculous. Instead of taking, you know, Napoleon and maybe putting him at a certain place at one particular battle and, and talking about how that affects it, because we know who the character is. And I've always thought that, that biographical films that deal with great individuals, a Patton or a Gandhi, tend to work. They may not be great films, but they you, you can watch them. But uh, two, two films that uh, come to mind recently was uh, the Beautiful Mind film that won an Oscar, uh, which, uh, you know, I didn't particularly find the Nash character that interesting. And then also uh, Autofocus, which was on uh, the TV star Bob Crane, who was a porno act who ended up uh, probably being murdered by his, what was then his best friend. And I didn't find really that interesting. And I'm just wondering, uh, do either of you have thoughts about biographies? And Josh, would you ever do a, a film on a, a particular individual? If I've written uh, several scripts about real people, but, you know, from my point of view, they have to have had spectacular lives. Yeah. I mean, I've written one script about uh, uh, young Teddy Roosevelt. Sure. When he was uh, a rancher out in Montana and the Badlands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wrote another one about the most decorated uh, uh, Marine, U.S. Marine, uh, enlisted man in history, which is uh, uh, Gunnery Sergeant Dan Daly in the Battle of the Bel the Battle of Bellow Wood. Okay. But they had very spectacular lives, as did George Patton or Mohandas Gandhi. So I think that's the key to uh, making a biofilm, is choose somebody that had a life that was worth filming. Yeah. Did, did anyone see uh, 32 short films about Glenn Gould? Yes. Yeah. That, I thought that was a fantastic approach to a biography. I thought that was amazing. I did see that. I liked it a lot, too, but, but I liked it partly because it was a musical film. I, is, I think one of the problems with uh, shooting a biographical film is that uh, the critics make you feel that you have to be true to the person's life. And because a person's life is so immense, right. that's almost impossible. So that to make something work dramatically, um, you, you, one, a filmmaker or an actor or a writer has to distort right. to make it work dramatically. Okay. And, and the, the, the problem the writer or filmmaker has with that is you're always getting saying, well, I can't really... I really can't capture all of this. I have to tell what, as you said, taking Napoleon at one point, or someone said at one point in his life, and just picturing that instead of doing all of Napoleon. Yeah, that would be better. Um, you know, to go back to the Aristotelian thing about uh, everything having to happen in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is the real person gets in the way of... Uh, dramatic storytelling. Isn't that right, Josh? Well, I'm just thinking about Patton, which is the example that keeps coming up here. And I actually, uh, when Coppola first started his website, Zoetrope, mm -hmm. uh, this has got to be five, six years ago, I got into a fairly long chat with him. It was There were several other people, but it just turned to me and him discussing Patton for about an hour. Okay. Right. Online? And I said, you know, I'm really impressed with that screenplay. And he said... What made the screenplay work was finding the metaphor right. of Don Quixote. Oh, right. okay. And once he found that metaphor, then suddenly he could make visual terms out of Patton's life. And, you know, you're not getting all of Patton's life. You're only getting World War II, which is all that's really crucial. And right. only certain aspects of it. Um, and only certain aspects of it. And even the parts that are most important uh, may not have even happened. Right. You know, when he's w driving up the road to the battle and he says, turn here, the battle was there. And they go, no, no, it's over this way. He goes, no, the battle was there. Right. He, 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 and it's 2,000 years ago. The right. Carthage. Oh, the Carthage scene, yeah. And right. that scene may well have never happened, but that gets you to the core of George Patton. Right. Exactly. 
And so you're trying to get at the essence of the man, which Coppola was able to do, and it's amazing. He knew, he knew nothing about the guy until the producer, Frank McCarthy, came to him and said, would you like to write a screenplay about him? Here are two books. Yeah. And he read two books and wrote that screenplay. Hmm. So. Right. Uh, an, another another successful film, and it, I, I don't think it's his, his best film, but I think it, it, it's a damn good film, is The Raging Bull. Mm. Uh, Raging Bull, you know, the story of Jake LaMotta, the boxer. And the, the interesting thing there... Of course, easy, isn't it? Yes. Yes, because easy. Uh, the interesting thing about that film is, you know, it follows him over the course of a life. But basically, it's, it's one... Here you've got this guy who's the ultimate macho Italian man, but the whole film is about impotence. And there's the one scene where the fat Lamada is in jail after a, a, being accused of rape of a 14-year-old girl, I think it is. And he's just pounding futilely on, on the cement wall. And that's With the, his head. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's the scene that, that encapsulates the whole character there. And, and, and that makes that film, I mean, a lot of the... I mean, it's a damn good film. But that's one of the things that's missing in most biographical films, like, say, The Hours. The 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 opposite uh, of that is you know in the hours is the scene where the the Virginia Woolf character is looking down in awe at a dead bird and it's so phony it's so placed to to draw a, a, how deep it is and yet so much more interesting so mu is is De Niro you know p banging his head on the wall there as Jake LaMotta and I think that's one of the things that that when when you know go, getting back to poetry with George is when you read a lot of uh, uh, poems that are about a particular character you get just the expected you get you get this here this is supposed to be deep I'm, I'm thinking you know there are so many poems that I've read for example on Albert Einstein and usually all of them have like an epigraph E equals MC squared like oh yeah. boy <laughs> and they don't they don't ever really touch on on a particular aspect of, of, of that character and I I just it's one well, of those as an example, let yeah. me jump in here. I, I don't know if anyone else watched it, but they just did a two-part miniseries on Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Yeah, I saw part of that. Yeah, I did and, too. Yeah, I thought it was very weak. Mm -hmm. I was okay. kind of, I was interested that they actually did it, but yeah. they didn't try at all to figure out who the man was. Yeah. You mean Nazis are bad people? So all yeah. we're getting is that he screams a lot and spittle flies out of his yeah. mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Why did sixty million people follow him? And as an example, and I've read a fair amount about him, yeah. just one scene would have helped so much of him and his friend, Putsy, Hofstangel. Yeah. After one of the big Nazi rally rallies in the 20s, Hofstangel said, you know, all your Nazi songs stink. They don't get people going. And Hofstangel had gone to school at Harvard. He said, you need to have songs like this and played all the Harvard fight songs, the football songs. Yeah. And Hitler was so impressed that they adapted all the American football songs <laughs> to become all the Nazi songs. Yeah. That's where all the Nazi songs came from. And, and there's a great scene in uh, Zelig, the Woody Allen film, where uh, you, you, Hitler's giving his speeches, and, and it, they, it uses actual footage, and then there's a slight breakaway to an actor where the Zelig character comes in. But nonetheless, if you've ever seen footage of Hitler speaking, I mean, the guy was a great speaker. Even if you don't know what the hell he's saying in German, he had that charisma. But yeah, I know in an email you had said that there's, there's no attempt to get into the character because he's a repulsive character, he's a bad character. We, can't, we can't show that he's a human. At all, right. Yeah, right. He, 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 the character carries too much of a burden for the uh, too filmmakers much, and the audience. Maybe there's literally too much history there. Yes, there's too much. I mean, I printed there. a picture on my website in regard to it. It was not hard to find of Hitler smiling. Right. Because you never once see him smile in four hours. Yeah. Yeah, and all the people used to say, "Well, he was in person such a charming man." Uh, right. Women loved him. Um, and well, you know, he loved his dog. But the, 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 the point is that these characters are so large that um, unlike the go, going back to Greek dramatic times where the, the, the lives of the people were intertwined with the kings, okay, with the major figures. So you could do an Oedipus Rex and have it be meaningful to uh, the audience. Um, and it, 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 the, you didn't have the individual persona back with Oedipus Rex. Now we demand the in, individual persona rather than the representational figure. That's that's interesting point. Um, I would I while we've been talking about this, I've been thinking about a movie that's a personal favorite of mine called Thunderheart. 
um, which came from the mid '80s, starring Val Kilmer and directed by Michael. Oh, mid '90s. Uh, early '90s, mid. Okay, I don't remember now exactly. Was <laughs> that one set out in the desert? It's in the Badlands. Right in the Badlands. Yeah. Yeah, and basically that movie is um, is fiction, but because it was based on the Wounded Knee massacre of the mid '70s and the events that happened on the Rosebud Reservation, where where it was shot. Um, I find that movie particularly good at conveying the essence of the conflict that was going on out there, even though none of those people were really involved, except for one of the characters who's played by a uh, former activist and performance artist and poet John Trudell, who was a member of the American, uh, you know, uh, of AIM, the American Indian Movement, and whose family was killed, we think, by the FBI while he was protesting on in Washington, D.C., while Wounded Knee was going on. So there's this tremendous resonance in this film, and yet it's, quote, fiction. However, just like with the Pat and Carthage scene, which we don't think ever happened, the whole meaning and point of the experience of these people that happened on the res in the mid-'70s comes through the movie. I mean, it's almost like... Uh, you know, I, I guess I just want you to respond to that kind of idea. You know, maybe fiction is truer than life sometimes. I think it absolutely is. Okay. And it all comes down basically to the writing. Right. If you've okay. got a script, if, you've got, if the writer put in the time, and let me just, a quick example. The character I mentioned, uh, Gunnery Sergeant Dan Daly. Right. The most decorated enlisted Marine of all time. I took me five years to write this script. And to say that this guy had courage to say that he was you know tough what do these things mean they mean nothing right to find the motivation for why someone would do what they do is the whole key to both writing and acting okay and it took me five years of thinking about that guy of why would he do what he did and i'm not saying that this is necessarily the reason but i had to find one to make the character work on paper. You had to find a believable reason for the audience. Exactly. Okay. And my reason for why this guy could stand up in the middle of machine gun fire and not be scared by it is that it made him angry to watch his men die. Okay. Well, and I'm if he got angry enough, he could do anything. Well, let me ask uh, how that leads into film structure. In one of your essays, I know you had mentioned... Uh, the recent film In the Bedroom, which I thought was a good film for the first two thirds and then went in the crapper. Um, and you had, you had said you didn't think that, you th I think if I recall your essay, uh, Josh, you didn't like all three of three sections, whereas I thought the first section was No, good. I liked the first act. Okay. And but then they the, killed their lead character. Then the lead character dies. Then I, I actually thought there were some really poetic scenes of them dealing with the aftermath for about 10 or 15 minutes. There were some silent breaks there, and I thought it was great. And then I think it really, when, like you said in your essay, when the, the doctor goes out and, and kills the killer, I mean, I it was ridiculous. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm just... I, I, I'm stunned because this is a film that could have been a really good film dealing with how people really deal with that particular aspect of loss and they just fucked it up totally and I, I don't know where that cut is that is that studio suits that come in and just take it over or what I think that one was screwed up from the beginning yeah. I just think they had a, a, a bad story you know well, what I mean it, it was a written it was a published short story it was based on Okay. Uh, okay. So it it had literary roots uh, that ending. But, but, it wasn't done by the studio. But you know, here here he I thought it, I I actually thought it was a pretty good film myself. Yeah. So. Here, here's well, the, I feel like I'm sorry, but it's it's making a huge dramatic error to start off Act One with the kid as your lead character. That's true because and the kid the, wasn't the lead character. The the the, the doctor was the lead, the lead character. kill the lead character. You cannot kill your lead character. That's right. Well, well that's how about the Psycho? Audience's I, point of view. But Psycho Psycho did it. Hitchcock did it. I mean, we, we think Janet Lee is the main character until she dies. It's a stunt, and he pulled it off. Right. But for yeah. the most part, you can't do it. Okay. Right. But um, with a film like, uh, like that in the bedroom, you buy rights to a film when you, you're going to adapt it. Change it. If, it's, if, if, if the story has a weak ending, if it's got a great premise, a great setup, and, you know, the, the, the gun is faulty in Act 1 and... and, and you doesn't necessarily need to go on effect. Change the goddamn thing. I don't understand why... why well, this is a first-time filmmaker. This is his first film. He's a young film director. But, and and but, I thought he did... You know, if you want to talk about a film director who's in his 40s and who has a lot of experience... But this guy, I thought, did a pretty damn good job for a first film. It's Todd Field. But, and but, and but, uh, 
yeah, I, I agree with you that they made the kid the main character, and that was wrong because the main character should have been the father. But the turn it takes in Act 3 of becoming a revenge Ludicrous. movie, I thought was really, really lame. Unless you had no, Charles Bronson. It, it, I, I think you've misread it, Josh. I think, I think it's about him trying to keep his, 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 his wife's love. Hmm. She had lost all respect for him until, and he, he, he commits that act of murder at the end to, to, to regain her love. Mm, I don't mm. believe it. Yeah. Well, I, no, I mean, okay. I, yeah. We, we, we all don't always believe everything we see. <laughs> yeah, okay. Except From that the, on a basic bottom line for me in drama is if I can believe it, I can have fun. That's and if true. if I can't believe it, I can't have I fun. I can't disagree with that. Yeah. That's absolutely right. So, on, on a contrary point, um, speaking as somebody who reads a lot and then sees movies based on novels I, or short stories I've read, I frequently get really, really annoyed when a great piece of writing has the ending changed by the movie um, the, the first example and the worst example that comes to mind is the Humphrey Bogart version of Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep, which is a terrific movie going along until the very ending when they make it a happy ending and he drives off with the girl in the sunset, which never happens in the novel. And I thought, I thought, I thought it tanked it. When they did the remake in the 80s with Robert Mitchum, even though they set it in England, it was much truer to the novel and therefore a better story. Except that it's not nearly as good a movie. Well, it may not be as good a movie, but in, in terms of Raymond Chandler, adaptations, and I'm a big Raymond Chandler fan. I've read all of his stuff numerous times. I think that the only really good movie adaptation of any Raymond Chandler novel I've ever seen is the Robert Mitchum version of Farewell, My Lovely. Because it's you don't the, like the Maltese Falcon? I, that's Dash Hammett. That's not Chandler. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and yes, I do like that movie, but that's because that's basically word for word right out of, right out of Hammett's novel. I mean, there's, there's no alterations there. Including the fact, including the, 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 the film noir twist unhappy ending. So, uh, you don't like the uh, uh, Lady in the Lake? Uh, no, I didn't like the Lady in the Lake. I thought it was gimmicky. Yeah, well, it sure is. But from that first person perspective, I mean, you know, they kept the drama pretty, pretty well, but that first person POV. What is it? Murder My Sweet with Dick Powell was pretty good. That one was better, yeah. Yes, okay. that was excellent. Yeah. Well, we're, we're running out of time here. <laughs> Sorry. It's just... we're, we're running out of time here on our show, and uh, just want to, uh, the last few minutes, just uh, get in a, a few quick points and uh, uh, ideas from some people, and we didn't discuss nearly all we could. We'd have to double the show, but um, just wanted to, uh, I had read a quote someplace, uh, and I don't know which actor said it, but uh, someone once said, uh, an actor pretends to be somebody, but a star pretends someone else is him. And I'm just wondering um, uh, if uh, you, if both of you agree with that, and h how have you dealt with egos uh, in, in acting, uh, both as a director and a, 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 an actor? All right. If I may jump in first, because I hear a lot about this and people love to talk about it, I've personally encountered very little of it. Yeah. I find actors to be really, really open, nice, wonderful people that really want to do the best they can do and are, you know, I, I just, I mean, I ran into some of it with Anthony Quinn and he gave it up pretty quickly. Yeah. He just really wanted to do the best he could, too. Okay. My so, experience is that to be a professional film actor... Uh, I've run, in, I've run into very few big egos there uh, because the demands of professional filmmaking, where you're working 12 hours on the set and then having to work on the next day's script after that, you don't have time for that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and as opposed to the theater, which is rampant with with actors' egos, oh yeah, uh, I okay. find I I grew to hate working on a, on a stage because I was encountering these egos all the time where I used to was working in film and TV, we didn't have time for that. You just don't have time for that stuff when you're shooting film or TV, right, right Josh? Absolutely. <laughs> Let me and just... so I rarely encountered it. And the, and, the, and the ones who are like that find themselves shut out because the clock is running and that clock is money. And so they stop getting roles. Right. Yeah. Okay. Fi final question for both of you. If you had to have the proverbial, you know, one film, uh, one DVD to take to a desert island to, to watch, uh, which movie would it be, uh, George and then Josh? Oh my God! <laughs> what a what a question! Uh, Casablanca. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm doing my best Bill Moyes impersonation. I have to ask the obvious. So, uh, how about you, Josh? I think it would be the Magnificent Amberson. Oh, really? Interesting. My favorite, actually, my favorite uh, 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 Wells film is uh, The Trial with Anthony Perkins, which, except for the ridiculous last minute. Uh, 
speaking about changing the ending, uh, the, except for that ridiculous ending, I think it's a terrific film, and I think Perkins is even better in that than he was in Psycho, but... Take a foreign film, Les Enfants du Paradis, The Children of Paradise. That's a, yeah. Mm. Or okay. Forbidden Games. Or Forbidden... Well, I like, yeah. I like them both, but... Uh, Children of Paradise is a much yeah. more complicated, rich film that you can live with a long time. <laughs> well, one one of the reasons I do love film and like film is because other than po I think it is the closest art form to poetry because you can do the most there. Poetry is free from narrative, or it can be if it's done well. And you basically the poet uh, is almost godlike. And I think filmmakers have that same quality, and even more so than prose uh, writing. I think filmmaking is is the closest to poetry. As but, long as they're not making films for Hollywood. Yeah. Oh, okay. Point point taken. And point taken. with that, with that, uh, with that uh, we'll end up. And just want to let people know uh, if you want to find out more about Josh Becker. And I will, I will be uh, uh, getting some of his uh, his films uh, recently. And one of the reasons I, I did not watch any films uh, of his or, or order them beforehand was because if he if uh, his films turned out to be something like a Spike Lee, I'm just not the kind of person that could sit here and and, and bullshit with someone if if, like, <laughs> if 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 I'm talking about do the right thing and I want to pound the walls. But anyway, Josh's uh, website is uh, www.beckafilms.com, so you might want to check that out if you're listening to this show. And to George Dickerson, I guess you just have to Google uh, uh, his name and to find out uh, about his career. And George, you have any... Also, uh, some of my fiction is on the internet, and right. a lot of my poems are. Right, and do you have any... Uh, have you done any uh, recent work on TV or film that that's coming up? Or? Well, actually, I... Uh, I did a small part in the film uh, last year, and I did uh, the last three. Josh, the last three films I did were all independent, low-budget features, none of which found release. Mm, yes. Okay. Well, uh, we want to thank both of our guests today: filmmaker Josh Becker, and writer and actor and general man about town George Dickerson. Um, thank you both for joining us for this program. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And that's it for this edition of Omniversica. I'm Art Dricky, and... We're, we're going to end uh, with another poem or two from George Dickerson and maybe some music, and come back next month. Next month, we're going to be talking uh, poetry with uh, David Alpar, uh, uh, a writer who's written some pieces for Poets and Writers magazine, and a guy named Frederick Glacier who ripped into uh, the Poets Against the War website in the New York Times. So uh, we're going to keep the, the fires burning and uh, kicking some ass here and... Uh, uh, let's just listen to some poems by George Dickinson, and thanks to both. The Tree Dancer I knew a man with feathered feet Who danced atop the wind-strummed trees His laughter low, God was sweet He mocked my youthful ecstasies He showed me how the fancied moon Fell upward from the lemon tree He taught me why the wind's bassoon Intoned a doleful threnody when he went lost, he left a note stuck in memory's ceiling crack, how brick on twig I built a moat of doubt against his coming back. Never there, he was just my dream where the first drop conjures the stream. <laughs>